Welcome to the WCAI Garden Tour. I'm Mindy Todd, so glad you all could join us this morning. Um, I'm gonna bring Roberta on in just a second, but first, if you have questions about your garden or comments, um, add them to the Q&A, which I think you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A tab there. We won't be able to hear you or see you, so um, Q&A is how you can chat with us. Also, if you see a question that you like, you can upvote it, which will um, rise, bring it up to the top so that we are sure to see it. Also, we have a team working behind the scenes. Liz Lerner will be helping us out with the Q&A. Jen Gilchrist is our producer this morning, and Alicia Orsini will be sharing video and photos of our gardens, some of them submitted by you. Thank you for that. I'm going to bring Roberta Clark on, horticulturist and entomologist. Good morning, Roberta. All right, Roberta, Roberta you're still muted. All right, there we good go. Morning. Hi, hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, how are you? Good, and you know, we chat so much about our gardens on our garden show on The Point, and now it's an opportunity for people to actually kind of get a glimpse of them. And it's, we've been talking about how hot and dry it is, and it's raining, we got this nice, light, gentle rain, so I'm sitting under an umbrella so I don't get soaked, but yay, right? You yes. can't complain. I woke up to the sound of rain. Unfortunately, we've only had not even, uh, two hundredths of an inch yet, but I'll take anything I can get. Exactly. I wasn't going to complain when it was raining this morning. No, not at all. It's not at all. It can go all day long as far as yes. I'm concerned. I like this nice light rain too is, is much better than the hard rain that we get, right? Because it's can Well, it soaks in instead of running off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's weird. So um, let's get right to it. Uh, we're going to, we have a couple of, of quick videos of our gardens. We're going to start with a little look at some of my garden. All right, a little tour of my garden. Right over here is where I usually do annuals, and you can see the elephant ears in the back. And this is the scarlet runner bean that I talk about. It has these pretty red flowers, but also it's these beans that are edible, these nice long green beans, and that's just what they taste like, a green bean. Come back here, and you'll see straight back that's my limelight hydrangea. It isn't quite blooming yet. And behind that, tucked behind there, see there's one of my dahlias. I have lots of new lilies this year, which too bad you can't smell the garden. <laughs> Here's some milkweed, and I've tucked the rest of my dahlias back kind of behind the milkweed there. And back here, this is a secret spot. This is my grandson's pumpkin patch. And if you look down, that's a secret little path that goes to his playhouse, which I will show you in a moment. So come back around here, and here we have the path through the garden with the arbor. That used to be bluestone but I changed it to pine needles, so it's a little less dangerous for the kiddos running around. And you can see I have other lilies. And the lilies pretty much bloom from June through the summer. They're different, different ones. So check the garden path. Still have some bit of overgrown stuff, like this Joe Pie weed getting a little too much. I'm going to have to chop some of that out. And some hosta, and there's the playhouse. So the path runs behind that hydrangea, and according to him, the kids only allowed there. And we have some more hosta beds and things mixed in. Back to the lilies, and this is a great climbing hydrangea. We have two of them one in that tree, and one behind the holly up in that tree. And my herb garden is tucked back there by the house. You can see the nasturtium. And the vegetable beds, which used to take up this whole section, we've now reduced just to these two little beds here. The one on the left is mine, and the one on the right is Jackson's. Of course, this has been a work in progress since Jackson's. It's been a few years where I haven't been able to be out here that much, so we're kind of 
redoing. And you can see the limelight hydrangea is now in bloom behind me, which this was a couple of weeks ago that I took that video. So a quick little look at, at what we have in the backyard here. Um, yeah, and it, it's, I've had a lot of fun with the lilies um, between the they day lilies. They look beautiful. They are, and, and it's, I've been surprised because I haven't always paid attention to when they bloom when I planted mm -hmm. them, but I seem to have spread them out just coincidentally in the right locations that there's always something blooming. It looks um, like you have a lot of tiger lilies that are going to be I, blooming soon. Yes, I do. And they actually are blooming now. Yeah, they weren't blooming a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that was one little section and it has just really grown. It really likes that spot. So um, that's a good thing. Now, Roberta, everybody I know is really curious about your garden. So let's take a little peek at yours. Well, let me say ahead of time that I'm, I'm a collector. I'm not a designer. <laughs> so I have lots of plants um, and it's fun. This is in my front yard uh, as one of my puppies. I have three Jack Russells and it's mostly shade except out by the front fence. Uh, it's a corner lot, so it's really quite large. It's probably about 50 feet deep and maybe 75 to 80 feet across. And it's filled with hosta and hydrangea. Uh, up along the front of the bed, it does get sun, so I have uh, sun-loving plants there, but in the back um, along the fence, it's also sunny. This is in the backyard. When I moved to this property, this was there was nothing planted here. It was 100% turf, so I've removed most of the lawn. This is a little path uh, that goes between. This is a large bed off the back of my deck, and then this bed over here backs up to the little strip of woods that I have. It's in shade all of the morning, but gets some sunshine in the afternoon. So I can grow flowering plants, but most of the plants here are shade loving plants. And then it exits out to the driveway. Um, I can sit on my deck and, and look over all these beautiful plants. This is also in the front yard. It's outside of the fenced in area. And again, it's partial shade most of the day. So I have blooming plants as well as shade plants. And this is the entrance into the front yard. And then we're back in the front yard again. Yep, that's Duncan. Um, <laughs> I have an extensive collection of hosta. I probably Beautiful. have several, several hundred different kinds of hosta. You can't ask me their names because I don't remember except for a very few of them. It's really fun to go down this path out to the front uh, where I have some really exciting plants. Um, and I really just enjoy spending most of my time working in the yard, weeding and deadheading and cutting. Um, this is on the fence in the front and it's one of my um, honeysuckle. This is another shade plant. It's cinnamon fern. It gives great color and texture. It's one of my favorite hydrangeas called Tough Stuff. Uh, and these are two dwarf oak leaf hydrangeas called Ruby Slippers. Into the vegetable garden, this is my favorite, Costata Romanesco. This is Zephyr. I, I'm giving it away this year because I have so much of it. <laughs> um, these are my tomatoes. They're now ripe. Um, I, have, I have to pick them early because the chip rats are eating them. Um, this is a strancha, one of my favorites. And again, the, the view from a little bench in my front yard, uh, front garden, looking back at the house. And raspberry wine, um, bee balm. Hummingbirds love this. That is beautiful. Um, it's a great color. I really enjoy it. And if for the most part, it's mildew free. I noticed the other day, it's just starting to get some mildew. We've had such, such... Um, <coughs> humid weather and that's when the mildew really starts to kick in. Yeah, so pretty. Well, this is Hakanakloa, uh, Japanese forest grass. If it's happy in its location, it forms a giant clump like this. And this is peewee oak leaf hydrangea. It's supposed to be dwarf, but dwarf compared to what? <laughs> um, 
This is a, a hydrangea I dug up as a rooted uh, layered stem from the fairgrounds years ago. Um, I have one hydrangea in my yard that has seeded itself, so I've started digging up the seedlings and moving them around in this front garden as well. Uh, it's pretty much all shade except for the very front of the border and the very back of the border. This is my rescue. I rescued Dougal uh, a year ago. Um, he's kind, kind of a crazy dog, uh, mm -hmm. and this is a view uh, looking back at the house. Um, which is the north facing the north, so it's in shade most of the day and gets a little bit of late afternoon sun. Uh, Stewardia, one of my favorite blooming plants for mid-July, beautiful camellia-like flowers, uh, gorgeous fall cover, color, and beautiful bark um, in the winter, so it's, it's truly a year-round um, pleasure to look at. And this is a view from my front steps looking out into the front yard. And that's wow. Duncan. <laughs> yeah. Looks like the dogs enjoy the yard as much as you do. <laughs> well, they do. I put up the fence. This is my little sitting spot in the front garden. You can see all the seedling hydrangeas that are growing yes. underneath this bench. Uh, they're going to get dug up and potted up in the fall. I put up the fence in 2014, and the dogs absolutely love being able to run free in the front yard. Mm. It's a lot of fun. Duncan's 14. Um, the other ones are 13 and 11, so Ooh, senior animal. Yeah. yeah, we should mention, if you have trouble hearing, you can turn your volume up, so uh, feel free to do that. You know, you, you have the, your control to your own volume there. I have some questions already um, from some of our viewers. Roberta Phyllis says, Shasta daisies, love them or hate them? For next year, can they be sheared in May or June to decrease their height? Well, that's kind of hard to do. There are so many different cultivars of Shasta daisy and each cultivar grows to a predetermined height. If you shear them back, you'll delay the bloom uh, and they will be shorter, but you may not be happy with the results. The one I think is one of the best Shasta daisies is called Becky. Um, and it's probably 24 inches tall and the foliage stays beautiful green all summer long. It's in bloom right now um, and it's uh, just my favorite Shasta Daisy. Mm. And uh, uh, Patty wants to know, is the Scarlet Runner Bean an annual or a perennial? It is an annual, but what I do is I collect some of those green beans that you saw and I take the seeds out, put them in an envelope and I just plant them again in the spring. So it, it's a super easy plant, grows and um, hummingbirds love it. Hummingbirds do love it. Yeah, it's, it's a really fun plant. Um, Tara says, lovely, are climbing hydrangeas dangerous to the host tree? And what about ivy, which is climbing my trees? Definitely not as pretty as hydrangeas. The hydrangeas do not uh, harm the trees at no. all. No, yeah. there are two types of vines, those that circle around and entwine the stem. And as they grow, they can literally choke off the plant. And then there are those vines that hold, that climb by hold fasts. And hydrangea is one that climbs by hold fast. So it's not circling the trunk of a tree. Uh, it's just holding on to the bark. It's not penetrating it. It's not deri deriving any nutrients from the tree. I Best place for it is growing up a tree. It's really yeah. spectacular. And I will say it does take a little bit to, to start growing. I think it was maybe between three and five years, depending yeah. on how much sun. One of them gets more sun than the other. Yeah. But yeah. be patient. It's definitely worth it when those flowers are in bloom up the tree. It's just gorgeous. The the ivy are, the, the ivy they're the very tree, slow to start. But the ivy that she's mentioning, that's a different story, right? Well, I'm, uh, ivy's sort of become an invasive plant, um, and I generally try to get rid of it where I had it going up my chimney, and I tore that all down, um, and anywhere I see it growing out in the woods, it also grows with holdfasts. It doesn't twirl around, so it's not going to strangle a plant, but... Um, just Not the fact that it's your house, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> uh, Lois says, when and how is the best way to prune nine bark and wigilia? Well, those are spring flowering shrubs, and the general rule of thumb is you prune the spring flowering shrubs just as soon as they're finished blooming. So if you, they're forming their flower buds generally in August, so I would not be pruning them at this time of year. I'd probably wait till next year and uh, 
You can prune them early in spring if you want, you'll sacrifice the bloom, but if they've gotten quite large, which nine bark in particular can, um, it's better to sacrifice the bloom and get a better shaped plant, or you can wait until they're finished blooming and then prune them. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, uh, since I, I want to overseed my lawn with clover, should I do it now or wait until fall? I'd wait till fall. Mm -hmm. Right now. It's, it's a good idea. The clover's a great idea. Don't go barefoot. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that. I, I, I mentioned this the other day on the show that I have lived in this house 23 years, never been stung by a bee. I was, you know, doing some weeding, standing in the clover. And sure enough, I got a little too close and got stung on my, on the edge of my heel. Yeah. My, not, yeah. not the bee's fault, totally my fault. But, but I think the rabbits prefer the clover. I've had just a couple of lilies and early on the hosta, usually the rabbits don't bother anything except the clover. This year, early on, they did get some of the hosta and they did chow down a couple of my lilies. But as soon as that clover started coming in, I mean, that's where I see them most of the time. So yeah, yeah I bad. had I lost my Casablancas to them this year. Oh, um, ouch. Yeah, I had a nice big clump of Casablancas. They got totally eaten to the ground, um, mm -hmm. not a shred left, and they didn't come back. So no, I wasn't really sad. happy with that. Right. Marianne says, "Our gardens are an inspiration. Uh, how do you control grass among dense perennials?" Um, I just pull I'm, it. I'm always out there weeding. My favorite tool is, it's a Japanese weeding knife. I can't remember the name of it, uh, something or other. It looks like a knife um, and it's a, a heavy duty with a wooden handle and it just pops those weeds out so beautifully. So I'm out there, except when it's like 90 degrees with amazing dew points, I'm yeah. out there weeding on a regular basis. It's sort of my meditation. Yeah, it can be. I have to say those grasses can be a real pain though so trying yes, to pull them up. I try this incredible Roberta. I was just going to ask any chance to get a, a plant list. We don't even know the names of all the plants, <laughs> right? And you have so many. It would like what it would be a volume this thick. <laughs> yeah, I I mean I know a lot of what I have, um, but I've lost tags. So there are a lot of cultivars I don't remember what they are, and I just enjoy them for their beauty. There there are some hostas. Uh, that I know what they are without any problem, but there are many that I've long since forgotten. So, yeah, no, I, I, I once was going to sit down and make a plant list of my yard, but didn't happen. Yeah, and it changes, right, over it time. Changes. You know, all of a sudden you have something and then you don't. Um, years ago, when we used to do our volunteer party here uh, in my backyard. One of the volunteers. I remember that. Yeah, one of the volunteers saw um, the, you know, hot poker, that you know, bright orange hot poker plant. Um, and I don't know if we ha still have the photo, uh, but she just happened to send a photo um, this season to show us that uh, she, there, see, Man of Moons at the volunteer party. She said she got interested in this and she finally planted one and, and she wanted to show that, um, here it is. So yeah, Tony, thank you for sharing that. And I'm so glad I could inspire you, but my red hot poker is long gone, disappeared. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it, but where what used to be is, is no more. So yeah. yeah, things can change. Yeah. Um, Sam says, what type of trees do well in a very sunny location on the Cape that won't go too tall and would be nice for birds to feast on? Pusa dogwood um, is a great plant for full sun. It grows very well on the Cape. It has a big raspberry-like fruit uh, that's loaded with seeds in, in the fall. The birds love it. Sometimes it can be weedy. Um, some years, a lot of the fruit fall to the ground and the fo following year you'll have seedlings. Um, most of the time I just treat them as a weed and dig them out and get rid of them. Uh, another one that's really good for the birds is another dogwood. It's not full sun though, and it's the alternate leaf dogwood. It's actually a native plant, um, and it doesn't have quite the showy flowers that Akusa dogwood does or our native dogwood, um, but it produces blue-black berries in the fall that uh, one year I had a flock of cedar wax wings descend on the tree and just devour the berries, so it's really a great plant. Mm -hmm. Right, let's see, we have, um, my climbing hydrangea doesn't blossom. Uh, it, it's many years old now. It gets several hours of sun since the canopy of the oak it is, but it, growing on us thin. Anything I can do to encourage it to bloom? 
you might, if you can, selectively prune the oak tree so it allows more light to come in. Uh, uh, oak leaf uh, climbing hydrangea grows well in shade, but to bloom beautifully, it does need, um, I'm going to say, five or six hours of sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have to say, uh, you know, what is that? First year it sleeps, second year it creeps, third year it leaps. Not with the climbing hydrangeas. I no. want to say it was a good five years, I think. Yeah, before at least. Mine, yeah. <laughs> before it, and the one that's in the shade was, was even longer, maybe yes. seven years. Yeah, right. so it, yeah, it can be a while. Uh, Betsy says, is there a way to prevent Pachysandra from creeping and spreading? No. That's what it does. Right? <laughs> that's <laughs> what it's a ground wanted, cover. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you wanted to, you could just kind of keep, you know, pulling out. The, Edging the bed, you know, yeah. and cutting it off on the edge of the bed so it doesn't creep. If it's growing well, be happy because uh, a lot of people have problems with Pachysandra. Yeah. Um, so, but no, you can't, it's a ground cover. Yeah. Uh, your gardens are lovely. How water intensive are they given this precious Cape resource? Um, it all depends on how much rain we have. Uh, I really didn't, uh, outside of the vegetable garden, particularly when I was just planting it and putting in tiny plants and seeds, I did water that on a regular basis till the plants became established. But I didn't start irrigating my yard until probably after the 4th of July, because that's when things started really getting dry. And I have uh, mechanical timers on my faucet, so, and I've measured how long it takes to put out uh, between a half inch and an inch, depending on what sprinkler I'm using. And so once a week, I give it a good deep soaking, but lately it's been so hot and so dry, I feel I can't even keep up with it. And uh, I'll, I'll have deeply watered an area one day and two days later, things are wilting. So right now is a potential for some rain coming next Tuesday. Uh, the remnants of whatever this little hurricane is down in Florida right now. So I've got my fingers crossed. We need a good day long soaking, not heavy rain that runs off, but a nice day long soaking. So in a normal year, I'm going to say once a week, Yeah. Deep, but, but it's a deep soak. And it's been interesting. I know in Falmouth now we have a, a water ban in effect. And it's, mo it's not that there's a water shortage. It's more that everyone, because there's so many people right. here right now, everyone is watering in the morning at the same time, right. which right. is creating some problems. I, I normally I try not to use my, sp I don't have an irrigation system, but I try no, not I to use either. the sprinklers unless it's, it's really dry, which I have done twice. Um, but I do hand water. I hit obviously the pots and some of the things that look a little dry, I'll, I'll hand water pretty much daily, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, you, you just, you hope for rain so you don't have to water for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, Emily right. says, we, um, oh, I was Go going to say, the, the rule of thumb is that most plants need an inch of water a week. Uh, and normally, we can depend on that uh, from rainfall. Uh, so some years, I don't need to irrigate at all. This year, we really haven't had good rain since, I'm going to say, mid June? the end of June. Yeah, June. You know, and so probably like, six to eight weeks almost. And I never water the grass. No, oh, I don't either. Yeah, it that, gets watered it, because it, yeah, of my bed. But. Yeah, but the rest of it, I, it can turn brown and it'll come back. Right. The thing is, you don't have to mow it when it turns brown. So that's, <laughs> <a good thing. laughs> that's Emily, right. Yeah, Emily says, my two zucchini vines are covered with mildew this year. They produced several squash, but have stopped producing. Should I just pull up the vines now? You know, you could pull up the vines now and replant. And you would be getting some zucchini towards the end of September. So if they're not doing it for you at this point and they've got mildew, which, you know, anything that can get mildew when we have humidity like we have this year, it's going to get mildew. So uh, if they're not producing, if you're not happy with them, yank them and plant either more zucchini or something else in that spot. Okay. Um, I just a couple weeks ago planted the uh, wax bean, yellow beans. I love those. So where I have pulled up all my lettuce, I, I put in the, because I have as you saw, much smaller vegetable beds. I used to have these great, you know, I huge remember ones of, of <laughs> took up that whole lawn space, but yeah. figured maybe the grandson need a little more yard to play in, so we took those up. Um, let's see, uh, Lois says, any way to keep bunnies from nipping off my black-eyed Susans at this point? Well, you, you can try a repellent. Um, I know C.L. Fornari swears by a mixture of egg white, 
milk in a gallon of water because really? bunny yes and and her reasoning behind that is bunnies are vegetarians and of course if you use milk and egg whites that's protein which they don't like and i i don't know the ratio i think it's maybe a cup of milk and a cup of egg whites in a gallon of water or something along those lines maybe half a cup uh, and she sprays the plants and they it really helps her in in managing uh yeah, bunnies yeah look, if you try that let's try you say you if you try it it works let us know yeah. <laughs> uh let's see betsy says can you suggest some deer resistant shade plants oh you know uh, that's a tough one because deer they'll eat whatever they want one year they might eat your hosta the next year they might be eating your holly, uh, even though it says, no, they don't like holly because it has spiny leaves. I've had them eat holly. So it's, um, it's pretty tricky. You could try the egg white milk and water solution because deer are also vegetarian. Uh, so that may help. Uh, some people swear by Irish spring soap, mm -hmm. uh, shave it and hang little uh, bags of soap shavings. Uh, apparently the deer do not like the, the odor of Irish spring, um, but there's really nothing yeah. good. And if you happen to be on Nantucket, the deer will eat, I mean, they're so hungry. Anything. They will eat anything yeah, exactly. because they d don't have an option. So it depends where you are, what, what they call deer resistant, right? Exactly. It's Let's situational. See. Yes, exactly. All right, see, Patty says, my ornamental cherry has leaf blight every year that is starting to spread to other plants. I guess that it is uh, 20 to 30 years old. Should I remove? Wow, a cherry that's 20 to 30 years old? That's, that's a good long life for a cherry. The effective um, ornamental value of a flowering cherry is about 15 years. So mm -hmm. she's already gotten her money's worth out of that tree. Uh, cherries have a lot of fungal disorders. It, it's probably not spreading to other plants because most diseases are specific to the plant they're growing on. Um, and what's showing up on other plants is something different. We have lots of different fungi and bacteria. Um, if the tree is near and dear to your heart, you could use a fungicide at bud break, which is very early in the spring, and repeat it every seven to 10 days for probably three or four applications. And that may help, but there's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. I actually just chopped down my cherry. It was probably had been there 15 years. Yeah. And it just, I mean, it, it, most of it had, was dead at this point. Right. And, uh, so going to be looking for something to replace that in the spring, but we just took that down. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful tree, but like I said, doesn't last forever. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Karen says, my hydrangea have been looking very droopy. Uh, is it bad uh, Is it bad not, not to water them? I guess it depends how much sun they get, right? If you get a lot of sun, you might need to water them. Well, that's the problem. Um, my hydrangeas that are in pretty much full shade, um, tend to look fairly good, but the ones that get sun, not all day sun, but partial sun, in the middle of the day, if the sun hits them, they wilt like crazy and they perk up again after dark. Um, even if they're well watered, they wilt. So that's just a function of, of they don't like hot afternoon sun. And I knew that when I put them there. Um, so I, I have no one to blame for that but myself. <laughs> yeah, it actually has been though, for most hydrangeas, it's been a very good year. Oh, fantastic year for hydrangeas. You know, we had a very mild winter um, and all the flower buds survived and all of them bloomed. So what a year for hydrangeas, it was just mm -hmm. gorgeous. Yeah, and again, if, you're, if you have a question or a comment for us and the, if you look down at your Q&A section there, you can, um, you can send us a question or comment. Let's see, um, Becky Sue says, why aren't the chipmunks and every other animal and bug in the garden eating all your greens and vegetables as, as they are there? Um, I actually, I don't have a lot of chipmunks. I've, only, I've seen a couple. I will tell you that something has eaten some of my tomatoes just as yes. they ripen. I'm now picking them as soon as they start to get a Me little too. bit red so that, and bringing them in so that they, they yep. don't get them. And I think people think they have to leave them on the vine until they're red. You don't. Once they start turning color, they're already in the process of ripening. So if, if it's blushed with red or pink, 
Um, it doesn't have to be fully ripe. You can pick it at that point and put it uh, out of the sun uh, on your uh, kitchen shelf and it ripens up very well and doesn't lose any, any flavor. Um, I have I don't know if it's chipmunks or rats, so I just call them chip rats. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, I fenced off my garden so it's not bunnies, um, and I am losing tomatoes. And what's really annoying is they'll take a couple of bites out of one and then move on to the next one. And um, Finish the one you started. <laughs> exactly. I don't mind sharing, but really... You yeah, know. and you, Becky, so you can't see it, but um, my sweet potato vine, it looks like lace, as does one of my um, hibiscus. Uh, so yeah, we, we have those problems too. I just tend to, uh, I pretty much just say, hey, it is what it is. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I think there's something to be said when you don't use a lot of pesticides and things, your garden seems to be healthier. Um, yeah. I, I, I feel like it just... Um, you know, I don't know, Roberta, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the only thing I use in my yard pretty much is a, spin, a product containing spinosad, like Captain Jack's dead bug. Um, and I use it on certain plants that I know are going to have problems. I use it on my perennial hibiscus because they get a sawfly larva that totally uh, shreds the leaves. Um, and it weakens the plant. They're basically defoliated and they don't come back the following year quite as vigorously. So I go out when I see the first signs of that, I go out with the um, spinosad and I just give it a good spray and then I'll go back out about a week or so later and maybe one more time after that. Mm -hmm. um, I also use the spinosad on my cabbage and kale and things like that for the cabbage worm. Um, but other than that, I don't really use mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. Marcella says, I love this. Thank you. My limelight is much more sparse than Mindy's. Does it take time? I, you know, I, I can't, I don't recall it not blooming pretty much right away. I did plant it when it was much smaller, but I think it, for me, it just really, it gets full sun and it just really likes that spot. I don't know. Overall, um, Roberta, do, does it take time? Well, again, you know, the, the sleep, uh, creep, and leap, uh, you know, you really won't see a lot um, until at least the third year. For, and that's true of almost any flowering shrub that you put in. But after they're three years old, they should, you know, each year give you a spectacular show and better each year. They get bigger. Yeah. Yours is huge. <laughs> yeah, really. It got a lot bigger than I expected it to, but it literally gets full sun all day long. Yeah. yeah. They like that. Yeah. So Sam says, what are some good smelling uh, border flowers that you would recommend? Uh, lilies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't have anything as fragrant as a lily. No, it's true. Um, that's probably the most fragrant of, of all the flowers. Phlox, surprisingly, is fragrant. So phlox, I enjoy. It's a, it's a more subtle fragrance than a lily. Lily, sometimes if you cut some and bring them in for a bouquet. And if it's in a smaller room, it can be overpowering. Um, Phlox, on the other hand, is more of a light floral scent. It's really quite nice. Uh, some day lilies are fragrant, not a lot, but some are fragrant. Um, dianthus or pinks are, they smell, um, it always smells, smells like cloves, carnations, mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's lots out there. Yeah, Honeysuckle. I say on the annual side, you could, you know, there's petunias. Oh, yeah, uh, petunias are fragrant. Marigolds. Um, yep. yeah, there's, yeah, a lot of people don't like the scent of marigolds. I do. <laughs> I, I love it, so I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. All right, so let's see. Um, Betsy says, the, the lower five feet of my arborvitae were eaten by deer. Will they be bare forever? Yes. Unfortunately, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Maybe you can think of something to plant under there that will cover plant, the spot. Plant a, plant a rhododendron in front of it. There you go. There you go. Um, a kayaker says, many of my tomato flowers are now turning brown without fruit. There are tomatoes from earlier blooms, plenty of pollinators in the yard. Yeah. Probably a watering problem, do you think? Mm, actually, can... it's temperature. Um, yeah. Tomatoes have a range of temperature in which they're capable of being pollinated. Once it's much beyond 85, and certainly when it's up in the upper 80s or low 90s, um, the flowers just 
do not pollinate. And so they turn brown and don't set fruit. And that's just um, the same thing is true below a certain temperature. Um, so early in the spring, if it's still chilly, uh, they won't set fruit readily. Um, and when we get into these hot heat spells, it was 96 in Hyannis the other day. Crazy. You know, I mean, this is Cape Cod. <laughs> you know, um, so that's just a function of temperature. It's too hot. The same thing happens with peppers. Yeah. So they'll bloom, you'll see flowers, and then no fruit. And if you recall what the temperature has been, if it's in the upper 80s or low 90s, that's a function of temperature. Uh, we've got a recipe for that uh, milk and egg thing. You're talking, one cup milk, one beaten egg mixed into one half gallon of water. Strain through, strain through a dish towel to remove the egg solids. Use all of it at once because it doesn't keep. Thanks for that. That's, that's a, good. a good tip. Good. Uh, let's see, what's the best time to replant lettuce, lettuce, spinach, seeds, et cetera? When it, not now. <laughs> well, <laughs> in another right? couple of weeks, actually, yeah. if, you, if you, most lettuce does not like the temperature we're having. Um, but if it cools off over the next couple of weeks, it's a great time to plant for the fall. I mean, I know it's tomorrow's August 1st and I'm talking yeah. fall. I'm actually looking forward to it. Um, I, I like May and June and I love September and October. Those are probably my four yeah, favorite sure. months. Yeah. Um, so by mid-August, you can replant um, beans, you can replant lettuce, you can replant beets and carrots, you can plant kale. Um, you could try for another crop of zucchini, but I'd actually plant that now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and look for varieties of lettuce that are heat tolerant. If you can find uh, something called slow bolt, um, it's an old fashioned variety and, and it really works well in hot weather or romaine. Romaine tolerates hot weather better than, um, I wouldn't even bother with an iceberg type lettuce. Yeah, I'm gonna pause on the question just for a couple minutes because we do have a couple short videos that we wanna share. Um, and I, I think we'll start with, with Catherine Iden. Catherine is our morning edition host and I think she just has an absolutely lovely garden. Let's take a look. Hello. This is Catherine Iden coming to you from behind the camera instead of the radio microphone, welcoming you to our little house in Barstable. We have about an acre here and I'm sure as with all gardeners, we have beds that are all a work in progress. That includes around the mailbox where we used to have a Rose of Sharon that like eclipsed the mailbox and the mail deliverer did not like that so we've moved that to a new happy home it's actually doing better but I wanted to just quickly show you these alliums the bees love them love them a great example of you learn as you go this is a bleeding heart from Mindy and this bed is a full sun dry bed so I will say the bleeding heart is done fairly well here but it needs to be moved to a shade garden. Now we have some more shade gardens going, so that that will be moving to a new home. You can see some holes here, and that's where I've been thinning out the iris because I have plans. So a lovely blue spruce that will eventually be the end of the bed. We're gonna scale the bed back. Some volcano phlox here, that pink flower, that's from Mindy. There's white as well, it's passed. A spirea that in the spring, it's just, oh, I love it. It is like lime green and yellow with pink on the leaves and then bright pink flowers. And then I just, I like it as it is. I let the flowers stay. The same with the alliums you can see here in the background. I love alliums, I love purple. These obviously are spring plants that have passed, but I like the structure, it's kind of fun. A smoke bush. They say first year sleep, second year creep, third year leap. Well, this one has done just that with gorgeous flowers this year. And I uh, have gone to Google University to figure out how to appropriately prune it so that it's a little more shrubby in future years, but I love it. Uh, I've been planting over the last two years things I can see from the house, and that includes a hydrangea, but a lovely lesson on being on the Cape here. I bought this pink. And uh, this is what it came back this year, but that's okay. I love it. It's still beautiful. But I want to thank you for stopping by our little humble abode. Our, our grass needs a little work, but you know what? You learn as you go. And we've got a lot of pretty color here, and uh, we're having a happy 
summer. I hope you do as well and stay safe. Love it. Uh, I love that smoke bush that she has, isn't it? That's gorgeous? a beautiful one, isn't it? It really is. And, and you know, she talks about a work in progress and that's the same for all of us. <laughs> all oh yeah, and, and it's always a, bur a work, work in progress. You know, uh, the, the garden is never done until you either move or pass away. <laughs> right, exactly. We also have a, a video from Sam Houghton, who's our morning edition producer. And Sam is a relatively new gardener. And I have to say, I am super impressed with his garden. Hello, I'm Sam Houghton, a producer at WCAI for the morning. I'm um, going to show you a little tour of my garden. Bear with me, it's uh, only my second year gardening. Real gardening, at least. Uh, so here, this is my vegetable garden. Come this way. Get some tomatoes. This guy's booming with some cherry tomatoes. Lots of kale. Got some new beans going in here. Some more tomatoes. And over there is squish beans and cucumbers. Got a lot of cucumbers already, which is exciting. And some broccoli and some zucchini. And we'll go this way. Uh, over there we have some hydrangeas. That can move a lot a little herb garden here. Uh, got some basil and parsley. I'm not really sure what this is. If anyone wants to tell me, that'd be great. Oh yeah, well the phlox, I'm thinking that uh, this is phlox here, will get a little bigger. That's one question I have. Um, some of my chastities, a lot of them just fall over. And I'm curious, instead, besides like sticking a rod in to keep it up, I'm wondering if there's a way to, whether it's the soil or something that make it so it doesn't fall over. Those are my questions, but some daisies about to, uh, or some kind of daisies, lilies about to pop. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Sam. I love it. And yes, that flox will get, he took that from my garden. That flux will get taller. Um, as far as the Shasta daisies, really other than staking them or maybe time to get, you're, you, they're, they're going to droop over. You can buy rings, little metal rings, mm -hmm. and they're legs that you stick into the ground. And I use that on plants that tend to get floppy. Even if they're in full sun, sometimes yeah. they just get floppy. So I, I like the, the rings. Um, they're very handy. Or you can use bamboo stakes and, you know, some green twine to sort yeah. of corral them and, and keep them upright. Yeah, but aren't you impressed with the gardens? I think he that's does a great there. job. Oh my gosh, I know. So we have a, a, a question here. When should we prune rhododendrons? If they need pruning, it should be done immediately after they bloom. Um, and you, when you prune them, you want to prune them back above a set of buds. Um, not just sort of chop them off mid-branch. So follow the stem back until, there may not be leaves there, but you, there were at one point, and you'll see little indentations in the stem where the buds will be, and you want to prune right above that. But usually it's right after they bloom. Right. Um, let's see, Kate says, tomatoes with, with a bite out. One theory is that the rats are thirsty. They say uh, one can put a source of water near the tomatoes and they will drink rather than taking a single bite. Opinions on that? Well, I, I've seen that. People recommend that. I have water out there, plus I'm watering my garden. So water is not scarce. I have a bird bath. Um, other people have suggested putting bird seed out there, but that's going to invite every chip rat in the neighborhood. So I'm not, right. do, I'm not going to do that. Um, I do have, I fenced off, I have seven raised beds of vegetables and I fenced them off individually this year with um, plastic fencing. The rats and the chipmunks just go right over it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm resigned to sharing, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, and as you said, when I see tomatoes beginning to turn color, I don't wait for them to be dead ripe. I pick them and bring them in on the shelf. Yeah, and it's so frustrating when they just take out one bite. One bite. Each. It's like, ah! Yeah. Right, Ron, Ron says, what can we do about greenhorn caterpillars on tomatoes? Um, they're really giant and easy to see. Well, actually, I take that back. They blend in with the foliage. What's easy to see is their frass, which is um, an entomological word for insect poop. 
Um, mm -hmm. And it's very large um, pellets, basically. And so if you see the frass, look above that uh, carefully into the plant. And they're usually hanging on to the bottom of the stem, sort of upside down. And just pick them off and mm -hmm. do something with them. <laughs> Do something. All right, Shelly, I planted a plum pudding coral bell last fall. It did great until about two weeks ago, then suddenly died. All the other coral bells look fine. Any ideas about what happened to this one? Well, I'd, I'd have to see if perhaps this one was in more sun than the others, or perhaps didn't get as much water as the others, or there are... Um, grubs of the black vine weevil, which is a, a, a weevil that attacks rhododendrons and other plants uh, that also get into the root system of uh, coral bells. So I, I might dig it up and look at the roots and, and maybe put it in a little nursery area and give it some TLC to see if it comes back. Mm -hmm. uh, Betsy says, I have seen hydrangeas that are deep purple. I understand how to change the colors by amending the soil to be more acidic, but how do you get that deep purple color? Is it a certain variety of hydrangea? Um, the most common way to do that uh, is to use aluminum sulfate every few years. You don't want to do it every year, um, but you use aluminum sulfate, follow the directions on the label so you're not adding too much, and you apply it in September, uh, and it will affect uh, the color of the plant the following year. Uh, the color of the plant is not only a function of soil pH, but also the availability of aluminum in the soil. Uh, you don't want too much because aluminum can be toxic to plants if you do it yearly. It's just way too much. But every five years or so, you could uh, treat them in the fall with aluminum sulfate according to the label directions, and it will give them a more intense uh, purple color except for the pink ones, some, you know, that are always pink. Some varieties are pink and they'll stay that way. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, let's see. Joan says, when you talk about planting zucchini, et cetera, now or in a couple of weeks, are you talking seeds or seedlings? Well, if you're ahead of the game, you, which I'm not, <laughs> uh, you can start some seedlings in little pots and then pop them into the garden. Mm -hmm. I belong okay. to the uh, Tara says, small garden, part sun. If uh, I would like something flowering in each part of spring, summer, early fall with interesting foliage when not in bloom, what mix of perennials would you suggest, preferably drought tolerant? Well, rather than try to go through a list of perennials, there is a wonderful fact sheet uh, that the University of Massachusetts put out a number a long time ago. And while the cultivars might not be current, the plants themselves, all plants bloom in a sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is actually called sequence of bloom in the perennial garden. Uh, and it starts in April and it goes through the fall and lists those perennials that bloom in those particular months. Um, so it's a great yeah. fact sheet, lots of good information in it. It's probably on the Cape Cod Extension Services website. If not, it will be on the UMass Extension website. An experiment, you know, I mean, that's what we, you know, we, you look at your garden and you say, okay, here's a, a week or two where I don't have any blooms and, you know, kind of play around with some different plants and, yeah. you know, it takes, it takes a few years to kind of get it all together. I, I always tell folks, don't, you know, lots of times we see something in full bloom and we're just blown away by how beautiful it is. Most perennials, the length of bloom is kind of short, two mm -hmm. to three weeks at the most, some yep. longer than that, but a lot of them, it's fairly short. So look at the foliage, look at the texture of the foliage, look at the color of the foliage, look at the structure of the plant. Is the foliage upright and spiky like mm -hmm. iris, uh, or is it more spreading like daylily? Um, so you have to use a combination of things about the plant in order to create the effect that you want. It, it's right. not just all about the flowers. Right. right. Karen says, you mentioned mildew on your raspberry, uh, raspberry wine bee balm. What yes. does the mildew look like and is it less prone to mildew in the sun? It's called a uh, powdery mildew and it looks like the foliage has been dusted with a light coating of powder. Uh, sort of a grayish white spots on the on the foliage. 
Um, mine get afternoon sun and they're just starting to show it. Um, some cult raspberry wine is supposed to be resistant, but resistant doesn't mean immune. That's something mm -hmm. else to keep in mind. Uh, it just means it's less likely, but it still can get a particular problem. Yeah. Um, same with flocks. So I look for varieties that are re resistant uh, and try to select those when I'm planting. Yeah. Alicia, I think you um, also have some, a, a little bit of slides from some photos from some listeners' gardens, if we want to take a quick look at that. Okay, um, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, oh, oh, here, we, here go. we go. Oh yes, this is uh, the question about her, uh, the this Sambucus lace tree there that I guess she had some dead wood on and wondered, a diseased wood and wanted to know whether she should just take out uh, the diseased portion or if she should uh, chop it all back. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, because? I would just take and prune out the diseased limbs and uh, this is not the time of year to prune it back. If you want to prune it back, do it in very early spring, you know, late March, early April, and um, but not in August or September. Is that the only one we have or we have more? Okay, we'll go back to questions. Okay, let's see. Uh, red maple leaves shriveling, browning and dropping. I see little worms on the underside of leaves. Orioles love to snack in them, so they that's do. something. But what's happening? Should I be concerned about the tree's health? It's probably water. Um, you know, maples have very shallow roots. Um, I have a Japanese maple in, a, in the backyard that is not uh, on my regular watering schedule. And right now, um, <laughs> leaves are pretty crispy. Um, it'll be fine. It yeah. won't look good, but it'll be fine. It'll be fine in the spring. Yep. Let's see. Um, I have a 100 foot daylily slash daffodil flower bed. It is wow. two years old. Yours looks terrific. What and when do you fertilize your bed and do you divide them regularly? No and no. <laughs> yeah, I'll say I don't either. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I actually, do, I, do, I do put um, compost every year. Yeah. I, I do compost. Um, daylilies, I have tons of them. Heritage Plantation years ago used to have an annual daylily sale where they dug and divided daylilies from their daylily border. And I would go, and I don't know the names, half the time they weren't labeled, but I have some gorgeous daylilies that came there. Right now, they need a lot of attention. Um, the dead stems need to be pruned out. And also, a lot of the foliage by midsummer turns brown. And mm -hmm. so I go in there with gloves on and just pull all the dead foliage out and, and prune out the stems. And then they look fine. Yeah. But fertilizer, I really don't. Uh, let's see. Uh, something is skeletonizing my hardy hibiscus leaves. I don't see the culprit. That's the ro the hibiscus sawfly liver that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they go, there are a couple of different generations in the summer. So uh, Captain Jack's dead bug or, or another product that contains spinosad, pay attention to spraying the underside of the leaves. Um, and uh, you know, you have to be on top of it every year. Mm -hmm. And then Lois says, uh, I, FYI, I've tried repellent cayenne pepper and uh, CL's formula. My bunnies didn't care. Maybe I just <laughs> need to start earlier in the season with the formula next year. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, it's, it's, you know, it's the struggle of the fittest and sometimes the bunnies are the fittest. Yep. And then Ken says, I have alyssum in a 12 inch planter about 20 inches deep gone brown how do i tell if uh, if it's dry or overwatered well both going dry and overwatering will produce the same result if you knock it out of the pot and look at the roots if they're all mushy and brown that's overwatering mm -hmm. um, if it's brown and doesn't look like it's going to come back chuck it yeah. And so the other thing too is if it's, if the flowers have gone by, but they're still green on the bottom, just snip the top, cut, yeah. cut it off and it will come back. Uh, right. Same thing with Lobelia and some of those other yep. um, annuals. Um, all right. So um, Alicia, do we have any more slides that we need to take a quick look at? Okay. Oh, look at this. Um, this is pretty. This is from Kate in Falmouth. Very nice. 
And then we have another one from Kate and Tom. I thought, oh, well, that's it. I, I love the orange flowers. Yes, orange. aren't they gorgeous? Yeah, they really are. And one of the great ones that anybody can put is the uh, butterfly weed. You yes. Don't do anything to that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the, the pollinators love it. Let's see. And uh, this is Ellie and Woods Hole. Wow, nice. Is that Cherry. Cor wow. And corn? Wow. I'm, I don't even attempt to. No, I don't, I don't, I don't grow corn. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, so uh, what do we have here? Scott and Mashpee. Great. I've never grown a curcumelon. I guess that's how you pronounce yeah, it. Um, neither have I. I'd be interested to hear how they taste. Yeah. Maybe Scott can call into the garden show and let us know. No, oh, Pamela, New Bedford City Garden. This is beautiful. That is pretty. I always love looking at other people's gardens. It gives you yeah. such inspiration, right? <laughs> Me too, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and I always forget, like I'm trying to remember now and, I, and take pictures to remember where I plant things because then in the fall when stuff is gone, I try to plant and that's how it ends up getting all overcrowded, but you know, what do you do? Mine is very crowded. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and so now here we are, it's July, um, August 1st tomorrow. Still plenty of garden seasoning left, as you're saying. Oh, there's yes. and, and also we should be thinking to the fall, what we want to plant in the fall for the spring. Um, yes. One of the things I, you know, as much as I love tulips, and I did plant some this year, the daffodils are much better. The tulips don't always come back or they come back very sparsely, right? So daffodils they're are not, Yeah, better. they're not reliably perennial. I love the daffodils and the narcissus and uh, crocus, although this spring the bunnies ate all my crocus. Squirrels um, do mine, yeah. And snowdrops. Um, I love the spring bulbs because they're there's nothing else out there and you need that bright blast of color uh, in late March and early April. So yeah, great, yeah. great time in the fall to plant your bulbs. Yeah, I would say the allium. I, I They're just, nice too. I had one allium and I, I was so, I thought I'm going to try some more. So I planted a whole bunch of allium for this spring. And we saw that in Katie's garden yes. where she left the allium kind of standing, even though when it's past, it's just sort of an interesting structure of the plant that it still looks good even after it's dead <laughs> it looks great and that's you know where i said look look at foliage look at structure don't just look at the flower and sometimes if you leave a dried flower it adds that element of surprise to your garden so yeah that was really cool yeah and uh this like this hour is going by so quickly i think we have one more question uh, this has made my heart happy. Thank you for doing this. So nice to put faces and gardens to the voices. Please do more if you can swing it. Oh, thank you, Tara, um, so much uh, for, and, and it says, if you can find Virginia bluebells, they are great in the spring too. I have a lot. Yes, they, they are. I have them. Crazy. I have them too. A lot of fun. Doesn't this hour go by super it was fast? It's great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I know Alicia has a few words that she'd like to uh, chime in. So Alicia. Hi, everybody. I wanted to just thank our attendees really quickly. Um, so many of you did this wonderful thing when you signed up for this garden tour and you paid it forward and you made a donation to us. And I want to thank you so much from everyone at WCAI. And uh, for those of you who are, that are members that are joining us today, thank you. And really your support is vital to the conversations that we're having, these fun conversations about the gardens that are really feeding our souls. And then all the way to the news that Mindy and the team are putting together at WCAI. So I just wanted to take a moment and thank you. And if you want to make a contribution to WCAI and you haven't yet, you can always do that at capeandislands.org. You can check out the red donate button. And we're going to continue to bring you great conversations with uh, Mindy and Roberta. And I want to just bring you back to them so they can wrap up this hour. Thank you so much for being here and especially a big shout out to all of our members. Thank you so yes. much. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Roberta. Roberta joins My me on pleasure. the point. Yeah, the third Tuesday of every month. So tune in. Um, we still have August and September before Correct. our season ends. So uh, Roberta's there the third Tuesday of the month. Um, and you can uh, see the videos and photos of the gardens that we shared with you today at our website, capeandislands.org. Thanks so much for joining us. Happy gardening. And see you next time. Bye.